Wispy Tales presents Lord of the Mysteries Written by Cuttlefish That Loves Diving Translated by Atlas Studios Synthesized by Wispy Tales Volume 1, Clown Chapter 1, Crimson Painful. How painful. My head hurts so badly. A gaudy and dazzling dream world filled with murmurs instantly shattered. The sound asleep Zhou Mingrui felt an abnormal throbbing pain in his head as though someone had ruthlessly lashed at him with a pole again and again. No, it was more like a sharp object pierced right through his temples followed by a twist. Ouch. In his stupor, Zhou Mingrui attempted to turn around, look up, and sit up. However, he was completely unable to move his limbs as though he had lost control over his body. From the looks of it, I'm still not awake. I'm still in a dream. Who knows, perhaps the next scene will be of me thinking I'm already awake, but in fact, am actually still sleeping. Xiao Mingrui, who was not unfamiliar with similar encounters, tried his best to focus in order to escape the shackles placed upon him by the darkness and confusion. However, while still in his reverie, whatever will he could summon was ethereal like a fleeting fog. He found his thoughts difficult to control and introspect. No matter how much he tried, he still lost his focus as random thoughts surfaced in his mind. Why would I suddenly have such an excruciating headache in the middle of the night? And it's really painful. Could it be something like a cerebral hemorrhage? Fuck, don't tell me I'm going to die young. I need to wake up. Hmm. Why doesn't it seem to hurt as much as before? But why does it still feel like a blunt knife is slicing through my brains? From the looks of it, I won't be able to continue sleeping anymore. How am I to show up for work tomorrow? Why am I still thinking about work? This is some authentic headache. Of course I have to take time off. I don't have to worry about my manager's grumblings. Hey, putting it that way, it doesn't seem too bad. Hee hee, I can end up getting some spare time for myself. Throbbing pain inundated Zhou Mingrui, allowing him to slowly accumulate immaterial strength until he was finally able to move his back and open his eyes. He finally broke free from his reverie. His vision first blurred before it was screened by a faint crimson red. All he could see was a study desk made of burly wood in front of him. Right in the middle was an open notebook with coarse, yellow pages. The title was eye-catchingly written with strange, deep black lettering. To the left of the notebook was a stack of neatly arranged books, numbering about eight. The wall on their right was inset with grayish-white pipes with wall lamps connected to them. The lamp had a classical western style to it. It was about half the size of an adult's head with an inner layer of transparent glass and an exterior grid with black metal. Diagonally beneath the lamp was a black ink bottle shrouded in a pale red glow. Its embossed surface formed a blurry angel pattern. In front of the ink bottle and to the right of the notebook sat a dark-colored pen with a fully circular body. Its tip shimmered with a faint glint while its cap rested right beside a brass revolver. A gun? A revolver? Xiao Mingrui was completely taken aback. The things laid before him were alien to him. It looked nothing like his room. While feeling shocked and confused, he discovered that the desk, notebook, ink bottle, and revolver were covered in a layer of crimson veil, a result of the light shining from the window. Subconsciously, he looked up and shifted his gaze up bit by bit. In the air, a crimson moon hung high above the backdrop of a black velvet curtain, glowing in silence. This. Xiao Mingrui felt inexplicably horrified as he stood up abruptly. However, before his feet fully straightened, his brain protested with throbbing pain. It made him temporarily lose his strength as he fell uncontrollably. His buttocks slammed heavily onto the burly wood chair. Pa! The pain did little. Xiao Mingrui stood up again by propping himself up. He turned around in a fluster as he began to size up the environment he was in. The room was not very large, with a brown door on each side of the room. Close to an opposite wall was a low wooden bed. 
Between the bed and the left door was a cabinet. Its two doors were swung open and beneath it were five drawers. To the side of the cabinet, there was the same grayish-white pipe on the wall at the height of a person. However, it was connected to a strange mechanical device with exposed gears and bearings in several spots. Items resembling coal stoves sat in the right corner of the room near the table, along with soup pots, iron pots, and other kitchen utensils. Across the right door was a dressing mirror with two cracks. Its bottom was made of wood and the patterns were simple and plain. With a sweep of his gaze, Zhou Mingrui noticed himself in the mirror, the present him. Black hair, brown eyes, a linen shirt, thinly built, average-looking features and a rather deep outline. This. Xiao Mingrui immediately drew a gasp as many helpless and confused guesses surfaced in his mind. The revolver in ancient European style and the crimson moon that looked different from Earth's moon could only mean one thing. Could I have transmigrated? Xiao Mingrui widened his mouth slightly. He had grown up reading web novels and had often fantasized over such scenes. However, he momentarily found it hard to accept the situation when he found himself in one. This was probably what it means to love a fantasy. In a minute, Xiao Mingrui had already cursed himself while trying to make the best out of his adverse situation. If not for the still throbbing headache that made his thoughts high strung but clear, he would have definitely suspected that he was dreaming. Calm down, calm down, calm down. After taking a few deep breaths, Zhou Mingrui worked hard to stop panicking. At that moment, as his mind and body calmed down, memories began flooding him as they slowly appeared in his mind. Klein Moretti, a citizen of the northern continent's Loan Kingdom, Awa County, city of Tinjin. He is also a recent graduate from the Department of History at Koei University. His father was a sergeant of the Imperial Army who had sacrificed himself during a colonial conflict with the Southern Continent. The bereavement allowance gave Klein the opportunity to study at a private language school and laid the foundation for his admission into university. His mother was a devotee of the Evernight Goddess. She passed away the year Klein passed the entrance examinations to Koei University. He also had an elder brother and a younger sister. They stayed in a two-bedroom apartment together. Their family was not wealthy and its situation could even be described as somewhat wanting. At present, the family was supported solely by the elder brother who worked at an import and export company as a clerk. As a history graduate, Klein grasped knowledge of the ancient Faisak language, deemed the origin of all languages in the northern continent, as well as the Hermes language which often appeared in ancient mausoleums as well as text regarding sacrificial and praying rituals. Hermes language? Xiao Mingrui's mind stirred as he reached out to rub his throbbing temples. He cast his gaze toward the table at the open notebook. He noticed that the text on the yellowed paper turned from strange to alien, before turning from alien to something familiar. It then turned into something readable. It was text written in Hermes' language. The Dark Ink wrote the following, Everyone will die, including me. Hiss. Xiao Mingrui felt inexplicably horrified. He instinctively leaned back in an attempt to widen the distance between him and the notebook, as well as the text on it. Being very weak, he nearly fell down but managed to extend his hands in a fluster to hold on to the edge of the table. He felt that the surrounding air was turbulent as though there were faint murmurings resounding in it. The feeling was akin to hearing horror stories being recounted by elders when he was young. He shook his head, believing that everything was an illusion. Xiao Mingrui found his balance and shifted his gaze from the notebook as he heaved for breath. This time, his gaze landed on the shimmering brass revolver. He suddenly had a question arise in him. With Klein's family situation, how can they have the money or means to buy a revolver? Xiao Mingrui could not help but frown. While in deep thought, he suddenly discovered a red handprint to the side of the table. Its color was deeper than the moonlight and much thicker than the veil. It was a bloody handprint. A bloody handprint? Xiao Mingrui subconsciously flipped his right hand that had been holding the edge of the table. Looking down, he saw that his palm and fingers were covered in blood. At the same time, the throbbing pain in his head continued. Although it had weakened a little, it continued incessantly. Did I smash my head open? 
Xiu Mingrui guessed as he turned around and walked towards a cracked dressing mirror. A few steps later, a black-haired figure of medium build and brown eyes appeared clearly in front of him. The person had a distinct scholarly air to him. Is this the present me? Klai Moretti? Xiu Mingrui was stunned momentarily. Since there was insufficient lighting at night, he failed to see something clearly. He continued forward until he was just a step short from colliding with the mirror. Using the crimson veil-like moonlight as illumination, he turned his head and examined the corner of his forehead. A clear reflection appeared in the mirror. His temple had a grotesque wound with burn marks along its periphery. Blood stained the wound's surroundings and there were grayish-white brain juices squirming slowly within. Chapter 2 Situation Tap! 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 Xiu Mingrui reeled back in fear at the sight that greeted him. It was as though the person in the dressing mirror was not himself, but a desiccated corpse. How could a person with such grievous wounds be still alive? He turned his head in disbelief again and checked the other side. Even though he was a distance away and the lighting was poor, he could still see the penetrating wound and dark red blood stains. This. Xiu Mingrui drew a deep breath as he tried hard to calm himself. He reached out to press his left chest and sensed his racing heart that exuded immense vitality. He then touched his exposed skin. Beneath the slight coldness was flowing warmth. When he squatted down and after verifying that his knees could bend, Xiu Mingrui stood up again and calmed down. What's happening? he muttered with a frown. He planned to inspect his head injury seriously once more. He took two steps forward and suddenly paused. The moonlight of the sanguine moon was relatively dark, so it was insufficient for his serious inspection. A memory fragment triggered as Xiu Mingrui turned his head to look at the grayish-white pipes and the metallic grid lamp on the wall right beside the study desk. This was the most common gas lamp of the times. Its flame was stable and its illumination capabilities were excellent. With Klein Moretti's family situation, even a kerosene lamp was a dream, much less a gas lamp. Using candles was most apt for their standing and stature. However, back when he burned the midnight oil four years ago to be admitted into Koei University, his elder brother, Benson, felt that it was an important matter which their family's future depended upon. Therefore, he insisted on creating conducive studying conditions for Klein even if it meant taking on debt. Of course, Benson, who was literate and had worked for several years, was not a rash person who did not think of the consequences. He had quite some tricks up his sleeve. He reasoned with the landlord to raise the apartment's standards by installing gas pipes to improve the likelihood of rentals in the future. The landlord was convinced and provided the money to complete the basic modifications. Then, using the convenience of working at an import and export company, he purchased a brand new gas lamp which was nearly at cost price. In the end, all he needed was to use his savings and did not need to borrow money. After the memory fragment flashed past his mind, Zhou Mingrui came to the desk where he turned the pipe's valve and began twisting the gas lamp switch. With a sputtering sound, a spark sounded from friction. Light did not descend upon Zhou Mingrui as he had expected. He twisted the switch a few more times, but all the gas lamp did was sputter and remain dark. Hmm. Retracting his hand and pressing on his left temple, Zhou Mingrui sought for the reason by rummaging through his memory fragments. A few seconds later, he turned around and walked toward the door. He arrived at the machine installation which was similarly inset into the wall and had grayish-white pipes connected to it. This was a gas meter. After seeing the exposed gears and bearings, Zhou Mingrui took out a coin from his trouser's pocket. It was dark yellow in color and had a bronze shimmer to it. The front of the coin was engraved with a portrait of a crown-wearing man, and there was a one on a clump of wheat on the back. Zhou Mingrui knew that this was the most basic currency of the Loan Kingdom. It was called a copper penny. One penny's purchasing power was roughly three to four yuan before his transmigration. Such coins had other denominations such as the five pence, a half pence, and a quarter pence. Despite the three types, the denominations were not in small enough units. 
In everyday life, one had to buy several different things just to spend a single coin from time to time. After flipping the coin, which was only minted and circulated after King George III ascended to the throne, a few times, Xiu Mingrui inserted it into the gas meter's thin vertical mouth. Clink! Clang! After the penny fell to the bottom of the meter, the sound of grinding gears sounded immediately, producing a short but melodious mechanical rhythm. Xiu Mingrui stared at the meter for a few seconds before returning to the Burleywood desk. He then reached out to twist the gas lamp switch. After some sputtering, there was a sharp sound. A fire plume ignited and rapidly grew. Bright light first occupied the internals of the wall lamp before penetrating the transparent glass, blanketing the room with a warm glow. The darkness quickly receded as the crimson retreated out the window. Xiu Mingrui felt at ease for a baffling reason as he quickly came in front of the dressing mirror. This time, he seriously inspected his temple and did not miss a single detail. After a few rounds of inspection, he realized that apart from the original blood stain, liquid was no longer flowing out of the grotesque wound. It appeared like it had received the best hemostasis and bandaging. As for the slowly squirming grayish white brain and the discernible growth of flesh and blood around the wound, it meant that the wound might take 30 to 40 minutes, or maybe even 2 to 3 hours before it would only leave a light scar. The restorative effects that transmigration brings? Xiu Mingrui curled up the right corner of his mouth as he muttered silently. Following that, he let out a long sigh. Regardless, he was still alive. After settling his mind, he pulled open a drawer and took out a tiny piece of soap. He took one of the old and tattered towels hanging by the side of the cupboard and opened the door. He then walked to the public bathroom which was shared by the tenants on the second floor. Yes, I should clean up the blood stains on my head, or I'll keep looking like a crime scene. It's fine scaring myself, but if I were to scare my sister, Melissa, when she gets up early in the morning tomorrow, it would be quite problematic. The corridor outside was pitch black. Silhouettes were barely accentuated by the crimson moonlight from the window at the end of the corridor. They looked like a pair of monster eyes that silently observed the living late into the night. Xiu Mingrui lightened his footsteps as he walked towards the communal bathroom with a shuddering fear. When he entered, there was even more moonlight, allowing him to see everything clearly. Xiu Mingrui stood in front of a wash basin and turned the tap's knob. Upon hearing the gushing sound of water, he suddenly recalled his landlord, Mr. Frankie. As water was included in the rent, this short and thin gentleman who wore a top hat, a vest, and a black suit, always inspected the bathroom actively to take note of any sounds of flowing water. If the water gushed too loudly, Mr. Frankie would ignore all of his gentlemanly traits by flailing his walking stick and striking the bathroom's door, shouting things like darn thief, wastage is a shameless matter, I'll remember you, if I see this happen another time, scram along with your filthy luggage, mark my words, this is the most value-for-money apartment in Tingen City. You will not find a more kindly landlord anywhere else. Putting away those thoughts, Zhou Mingrui used a moist towel to clean the blood stains from his face again and again. After checking himself using the rundown mirror in the bathroom and verifying that all that was left was a hideous wound and a pale face, Zhou Mingrui relaxed. Then, he took off his linen shirt and used a bar of soap to wash away the blood stains. At that moment, he knitted his brows and recalled a possible problem. The wound was too exaggerated and there was too much blood. Apart from his body, his room likely still had signs of his injury. After Zhou Mingrui was done with his linen shirt a few minutes later, he briskly returned to his apartment with a moist towel. He first wiped the blood handprint on the desk and then, using the gas lamp's illumination, sought out spots which he missed out. He immediately discovered that quite a substantial amount of blood had splattered onto the floor beneath the desk. And there was a yellow bullet to the left side of the wall. Releasing a round with a revolver pointed at the temple? After mixing and matching the clues from before, Zhou Mingrui had a rough idea how Klein had died. He was in no hurry to verify his guess. Instead, he seriously wiped away the blood stains and cleaned up the scene. Following that, he took the bullet and returned to the side of his desk. He opened the revolver's cylinder and poured out the rounds inside. 
a total of five rounds and a cartridge shell all had a brass luster to them. Indeed. Zhou Mingrui looked at the empty cartridge shell in front of him and stuffed the rounds back into the cylinder while nodding. He shifted his gaze to the left and it landed on the notebook's words, Everyone will die, including me. Following that, even more questions arose in him. Where did the gun come from? Was it suicide or a fate suicide? What kind of trouble could a history graduate of humble origins get himself into? Why would such a suicide method only leave behind so little blood? Was it because I transmigrated in a timely manner and it came with healing benefits? After pondering for a moment, Zhou Mingrui changed into another linen shirt. He sat on the chair and began pondering over more important matters. Klein's experience was still not something he needed to concern himself with. The true problem was to figure out the reason for his transmigration and if he could return. His parents, relatives, best buddies, and friends. The fascinating world of the internet and all sorts of delicious delicacies. These were reasons that prompted his desire to return. Click. 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 Zhou Mingrui's right hand was subconsciously pulling out the revolver's cylinder and slamming it back into place, again and again. Yeah, there has not been much difference for me between this period of time and the past. I was just a little unlucky, but why would I transmigrate for no baffling reason? Bad luck? Yes. I tried a luck enhancement ritual before dinner today. A thought flashed in Zhou Mingrui's mind, illuminating the memories which were concealed by a fog of confusion. As a qualified keyboard politician, keyboard historian, keyboard economist, keyboard biologist, and keyboard folklorist, he had always deemed himself as knowing something of everything. Of course, his best buddy would often mock him as only knowing a little of everything. And one of them was Chinese divination. When he visited his hometown last year, he had discovered a thread-bound book titled Quintessential Divination and Arcane Arts of the Qin and Han Dynasty at an old bookstore. It looked pretty interesting and could aid him in posturing on the internet, so he bought it. Unfortunately, his interest was short-lived. The vertical script it used made the reading experience horrible. All he did was flip through the beginning pages before he threw it into a corner. He had experienced a spate of bad luck in the past month, losing his cell phone, customers running away after cheating him, and mistakes at work. Only then did he suddenly recall the luck enhancement ritual written at the beginning of quintessential divination and arcane arts. Furthermore, the requirements were extremely simple, without any basic foundation requirements. All he needed was to get four portions of the staple food in his area and place them in the four corners of his room. They could be placed on furniture such as tables and cupboards. Then, standing in the middle of the room, he had to take four steps in a counterclockwise fashion to make a square. The first step required him to sincerely chant the immortal Lord of Heaven and Earth for blessings. The second step was to silently chant the Sky Lord of Heaven and Earth for blessings. The third step was the Exalted the Arch of Heaven and Earth for blessings and the fourth step was the celestial worthy of heaven and earth for blessings. After the four steps were taken, he needed to close his eyes and wait five minutes in his original spot. Only then would the ritual be considered complete. Since it did not cost him any money, he found the book, followed what was stipulated, and did it before dinner. However, nothing happened back then. Who would have guessed that he would actually transmigrate in the middle of the night? Transmigration. There is a distinct possibility that it's due to that luck enhancement ritual. Yes, I should give it a try here tomorrow. If it's really because of that, I stand a chance of transmigrating back. Xiao Mingrui stopped flicking the revolver cylinder and suddenly sat straight up. Regardless, he had to give it a try. He had to attempt a Hail Mary. Chapter 3 Melissa. After confirming his plan, Zhou Mingrui immediately felt he had a mental crutch. His fear and unease were all swept away into a corner of his mind. Only then did he have the mood to carefully study Klein's memory fragments. Zhou Mingrui habitually stood up before turning off the pipe's valve. He watched the wall lamp gradually dim until its flame extinguished before sitting back down. 
As he subconsciously fiddled with the revolver's brass cylinder, he pressed the side of his head. He slowly recalled his memories in the crimson-eyed darkness as though he was the most attentive viewer in a movie theater. Perhaps as a result of having a bullet pass through his head, Klein's memories were like shattered glass. Not only were the memories not contiguous, there were many spots which were clearly missing. For example, memories pertaining to how the exquisite revolver appeared in his possession, whether he had committed suicide, or was killed, as well as the meaning of the words everyone will die, including me on the notebook, or whether he had participated in anything odd two days before the incident. Not only had these particular memories become fragmented, there were also missing pieces. It was the same even for knowledge he ought to know. In light of the present situation, Zhou Mingrui believed that if Klein were to return to university, it was unlikely he could graduate. This was despite him having left campus just days ago without relaxing one bit. He needs to participate in the Tingen University's History Department interview two days later. The university graduates of Lowen Kingdom do not have the tradition of staying at their alma mater. His mentor had given him a recommendation letter for Tingen University and Backlund University. Through the window, Zhou Mingrui silently observed the red moon setting in the west. The gradual sinking of the moon continued until faint light glowed from the east, dyeing the horizon golden. At that moment, there was a commotion inside the apartment. Soon, the sound of footsteps approached his door. Melissa is awake. She's really as punctual as always. Xiao Mingrui smiled. Due to Klein's memories, seeing Melissa made him feel as though she was really his younger sister. However, I do not have a younger sister. He immediately contradicted himself. Melissa was different from Benson and Klein. Her rudimentary education was not completed at the Sunday school classes offered by the Church of Evernight. When she reached schooling age, the Lowen Kingdom had enacted the Basic Education Law. A primary and secondary education committee was established and was specially provided with funding, increasing the kingdom's investment into education. In less than three years, under the premise that numerous church schools would be incorporated, many public primary schools were established to strictly maintain the principle of religious neutrality. This was to prevent education from involving itself in the conflicts between the Lord of Storms, Evernight Goddess, and the God of Steam and Machinery. Compared to Sunday school that only cost a copper penny a week, a public primary school's cost of three pence a week appeared rather expensive. However, the former only provided education every Sunday, whereas the latter provided six days of classes a week. In conclusion, the price was so low that it was almost free. Melissa was different from most girls. From a young age, she enjoyed things like gears, springs, and bearings. Her ambition was to be a steam mechanic. Having suffered from a lack of culture, Benson, who knew the importance of education, supported his sister's dreams just like how he supported Klein's university education. After all, Tingen Technical School was only considered secondary education. There was no need for her to attend language school or a public school for more knowledge. In July last year, 15-year-old Melissa passed her entrance examinations and fulfilled her dreams of becoming a student at the Tingen Technical School Steam and Machinery Department. As such, her weekly school fees raised to nine pence. Meanwhile, Benson's company was affected by the situation in the southern continent. There was a drastic drop both in profit and business transactions. More than a third of the employees were retrenched. In order to keep his job and maintain their livelihood, Benson could only accept more arduous tasks. He had to work overtime more frequently or head to places with harsh environments. That was what he was occupied with the past few days. It was not that Klein did not think of helping share his elder brother's burden but being born a commoner and having been admitted into an average language school, he felt a strong sense of inadequacy when he enrolled into university. For example, as the origin of all languages in the northern continent, the ancient language of Faisak was something all the children of nobles and of the wealthy class would learn from a young age. In contrast, he only made first contact with it in university. He faced many similar aspects during his schooling career. Klein nearly gave his all and often stayed up late into the night and woke up early before barely managing to catch up to the others, 
eventually allowing him to graduate with average results. Memories regarding his elder brother and younger sister remained active in Zhou Mingrui's mind until he turned the doorknob open. Only then did he jolt awake and remember that he held a revolver in his hand. This was a semi-regulated item. It will scare children. Also, there's still the wound on my head. With Melissa arriving at any moment, Zhou Mingrui pressed onto his temple and hurriedly pulled open a desk drawer and threw the revolver in before slamming it close. What happened? Melissa looked over curiously when she heard the commotion. She was still in the prime of her youth. Even though she didn't have much nutritious food to eat, making her face thin and slightly pale, her skin remained lustrous as it exuded the vibes of a young girl. When Zhou Mingrui saw his sister's brown eyes look over, he forcibly composed himself and picked up an item beside his hand before calmly closing the drawer to conceal the existence of the revolver. He placed his other hand on his temple, the texture confirming that his wound had already healed. He took out a silver vine leaf pocket watch and pressed the top gently, causing its cover to flip open. It was a picture of the sibling's father. It was the most valuable item the Imperial Army sergeant left behind, but being a second-hand item, it would often malfunction from time to time in recent years even though he had gotten a watchsmith to fix it. It had embarrassed Benson who enjoyed bringing it with him to elevate his status many a time, so it was thrown away back at home in the end. It had to be said that perhaps Melissa did have talent in machinery. After grasping the principles behind the watch, she borrowed the tools from her technical school to fiddle with the pocket watch. Recently, she even claimed to have fixed it. Xiu Mingrui looked at the watch's open cover and saw that the second hand was not moving. Subconsciously, he twisted the top dial to wind the pocket watch. However, despite winding it a few times, he did not hear the sound of taut springs. The second hand remained motionless. It looks like it's broken again. He looked at his sister while trying to find a topic of conversation. Melissa shot him an expressionless glance and briskly walked over to take the pocket watch away. She stood in her spot and pulled up the button sitting atop the pocket watch. With a few simple turns, the tick-tocking of the second hand sounded. Isn't pulling the button up usually meant to adjust the time? Xiu Mingrui's expression immediately turned blank. At that moment, a bell chimed from a faraway cathedral. It chimed six times, sounding distant and ethereal. Melissa tilted her head to listen to it and pulled the button up once again. Following that, she turned it to synchronize the time. It's okay now, she said simply without emotion. She then pressed the top button back and handed the pocket watch back to Zhou Mingrui. Zhou Mingrui returned a smile politely in embarrassment. Melissa gave her elder brother a piercing stare before turning to walk to the cupboard. She took her toiletries and towel before opening the door to leave. She headed for the public bathroom. Why did her expression have a look of disparagement and resignation? Is it a look of love and concern for a retarded brother? Xiu Mingrui lowered his head and chuckled. He closed the pocket watch's cover with a click before opening it again. He repeated this action as his idle thoughts focused on a question. Klein committed suicide without a silencer. Well, I'll consider it a suicide for now. His suicide should have caused quite a commotion, yet, Melissa, who was just a wall away, did not notice it at all. Was she sleeping too soundly? Or is Klein's suicide shrouded in mystery to begin with? Click! The pocket watch opened. Clack! The pocket watch closed. Melissa returned from washing up and saw her brother's subconscious act of constantly opening and closing the pocket watch. Her gaze was once again glazed with exasperation as she said with a sweet voice, Klein, take out all the remaining bread. Remember to buy fresh ones today. There's meat and peas too. Your interview is soon. I'll make you mutton stewed with peas. As she spoke, she moved a stove out from a corner. With some charcoal, she boiled a pot of hot water. Before the water boiled, she opened the cupboard's lowest drawer and took out what seemed like a treasure, a can of inferior tea leaves. She threw about ten leaves into the pot and pretended that it was real tea. Melissa poured two big cups of tea as she shared two pieces of rye bread with Zhou Mingrui over tea. 
There is no sawdust or excessive gluten mixed in, but it is unappetizing. Xiu Mingrui still felt weak and was starving. He forced himself to swallow the bread with the tea while complaining inwardly. Melissa finished eating a few minutes later. After she adjusted her black hair that reached down to her vest, she looked at Zhou Mingrui and said, Remember to buy fresh bread. All we need is eight pounds. The weather is hot, so the bread will easily spoil. Also, buy the mutton and peas. Remember to buy them. Indeed, she was showing concern for her dull brother. She even had to repeat to emphasize it another time. Xiu Mingrui nodded with a smile. All right. Regarding the Lowen Kingdom's pound, Xiu Mingrui matched Klein's muscle memory with his. He believed it was close to half a kilogram of what he was accustomed to. Melissa did not say anything further. She stood up and tidied the area. After packing away the last bit of bread for lunch, she put on a tattered veil cap that their mother left behind, picked up a self-sewn bag used to carry her books and stationery, and prepared to leave. It was not Sunday, so she had an entire day of classes to attend. Walking from their apartment to Tingen Technical School took about 50 minutes. There were public horse carriages that cost a penny a kilometer with a limit of four pence in the city and six pence in the city outskirts. In order to save money, Melissa would leave ahead of time and walk to school. Moments after she opened the main door, she paused in her footsteps and turned her body halfway, saying, Klein, don't buy too much mutton or peas. Benson might come back on Sunday. Oh, and remember we only need eight pounds of bread. All right. Sure thing, answered Zhou Mingrui exasperatedly. Simultaneously, he repeated the word Sunday a few times in his head. In the northern continent, a year was similarly split into twelve months. Every year, there were 365 or 366 days. A week was similarly split into seven days. The splitting of months was a result of astronomical observations. It made Zhou Mingrui suspect whether he was in a parallel world. As for the splitting of days, it was a result of religion. This was because the northern continent had seven orthodox gods, the eternal blazing sun, the lord of storms, the god of knowledge and wisdom, the evernight goddess, earth mother, the god of combat, and the god of steam and machinery. Watching his sister close the door and leave, Zhou Mingrui suddenly sighed. Soon, his thoughts focused on the luck enhancement ritual. Sorry, I really wish to return home. Chapter 4, Divination Returning to his chair, he heard the faraway cathedral's bells chime again. It continued seven times before Zhou Mingrui slowly stood up. He went up front to the cupboard and took out his clothes. A black vest with a matching suit, trousers that clung tightly to his legs, a half-top hat and his faint scholarly air made Zhou Mingrui feel like he was watching an English drama set in the Victorian era. He suddenly muttered softly as he shook his head with a wry smile, I'm not going for an interview. All I'm doing is buying some ingredients to prepare for my luck enhancement ritual. Klein was so concerned about his impending interview that it became instinct. When he was not focused enough, he habitually wore his only decent set of clothing. After taking a breath, Zhou Mingrui took off his suit and vest, switching to a brownish-yellow coat. He also changed to a felt hat with a rounded edge of the same color. With his outfit done, he walked to the side of the bed and lifted a square cushion. He reached his hand into an inconspicuous hole beneath and rummaged around before finding an intermediate layer. When he retracted his right hand, there was a roll of notes in his palm. There were about eight notes with faded dark green colors. These were all the savings Benson had at the moment. It even included the living expenses for the next three days. Two of them were five solely notes and the remaining were one solely notes. In the Lowen Kingdom's currency system, solely was ranked second. It originated from ancient silver coins. One soli was equivalent to twelve copper pence. They had denominations of one and five soli. At the top of the currency system was the gold pound. They were also paper-based but were guaranteed by gold and pegged directly. A gold pound was equivalent to twenty soli. They had denominations of one, five, 
and ten gold pounds. Xiao Mingrui spread a note and caught a whiff of the faint unique ink. This was the smell of money. Perhaps a result of Klein's memory fragments or his constant desire for money, Xiao Mingrui felt like he had instantly fallen in love with these notes. Look, their designs are so beautiful. It makes the stern and old-fashioned George III and his two mustaches appear especially adorable. Look, the watermark that can be seen when the note is placed against sunlight is so alluring. The exquisite design for the anti-counterfeit label makes it completely different from those fake fancy schlocks. Xiao Mingrui admired it for nearly a minute before pulling out two one solely notes. He then rolled up the remaining notes and stuffed them back into the cushion's concealed layer. After arranging and flattening the cloth around the hole, Zhou Mingrui folded the two notes he had taken out neatly and placed them into the left pocket of his brownish-yellow jacket. He separated the notes from the few pence he had in his trouser pocket. With all of this done, he placed a key into his right pocket and brought a dark brownish paper bag along with him and quickly walked toward the door. His shuffling footsteps slowed down from a brisk pace until it eventually stopped. Xiao Mingrui stood by the door and was unsure when he had already begun to frown. Klein's suicide was fraught with peculiarities. Would he encounter any accidents if he were to leave just like that? After some deep thought, Xiao Mingrui returned to his desk and pulled open the drawer. He then took out the shimmering brass revolver. This was the only defensive weapon he could think of, and it was the only weapon with sufficient power. Although he had never practiced shooting, just pulling such a revolver out would definitely daunt anyone. He caressed the revolver's cold metal before stuffing his revolver into the pocket where his notes were. He clasped the money in his palm as his fingers pressed onto the gun's handle. It was perfectly concealed. Feeling secure, he who knew a little of everything suddenly had a worry. Would I end up misfiring? Being deluged with such a thought, Zhou Mingrui quickly thought of a solution. He drew the revolver and released the cylinder. He then aligned the empty chamber which was a result of the suicide along the gun's hammer before closing it. This way, even if there was a misfire, he would discharge an empty round. After stuffing his revolver back into his pocket, Zhou Mingrui kept his left hand in there. He pressed down on his hat with his right hand and pulled open the door before leaving. The corridor during the day remained dim as limited sunlight shone in from the window situated at the end of the corridor. Xiao Mingrui quickly went down the stairs and left the apartment before taking in the brilliance and warmth of the sun. Although it was almost July, it was still considered the middle of summer. However, Tianjin was situated north of the Lowen Kingdom, so it had unique climate characteristics. The highest annual temperature was not even 30 degrees Celsius on Earth, with even cooler mornings. However, the streets were awash with filthy water and strewn junk. From Klein's memories, this was not a rare sight in low-income communities, even if there were sewers. After all, there were just too many people and people needed to survive. Come and try our delicious roasted fish. Hot and fresh oyster soup. Drink a bowl in the morning and feel invigorated all day. Fresh fish from the port for just five pence a piece. Muffins and eel soup make the perfect combination. Conk. 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 Vegetables freshly plucked from the farms outside the city. Cheap and fresh. The mobile hawkers who sold vegetables, fruits, and hot food shouted along the streets as they beckoned the rushing pedestrians. Some of them would stop and carefully compare before purchasing. Others would impatiently wave their hands as they had yet to find work for the day. Xiao Mingrui took in a whiff of the air that mixed both noxious and fragrant aromas. As he clenched the revolver tightly in his left hand, he held the notes tight. He pressed down on his hat with his right hand while passing through the busy street, slouching a little. There was bound to be thieves in populated areas. Furthermore, this street had no lack of poor citizens who were working part-time after losing their previous jobs. There were also starving children that were exploited by adults to do their bidding. He proceeded forward until he reached a point where the crowdedness around him restored to normal. He straightened his back and raised his head to look down the street. There was a vagrant accordionist busking. The melody was sometimes pleasant, sometimes fervent. 
Beside him were several children in ragged clothes with sallow complexions due to malnutrition. They listened to the music and moved to the beat, dancing self-made choreographies. Their faces were filled with joy as though they were a prince or an angel. A deadpan woman passed by, her skirt was dirty and her skin was dull. Her gaze appeared dull and sluggish. Only when she looked at the bunch of children did a faint glow flash. It was as though she had seen herself from three decades ago. Xiu Mingrui overtook her and turned into another street before stopping at Smyron Bakery. The owner of the bakery was a 70-plus-year-old granny named Wendy Smyron. Her hair was completely grayish-white and she always wore a genial smile. From the beginning of Klein's memories, she had been here selling bread and pastries. Oh, the tinged biscuits and lemon cake she bakes are very delicious. Xiu Mingrui gulped a mouthful of saliva and smiled. Mrs. Smyron, eight pounds of rye bread. Oh. Dear Klein, where's Benson? Is he not back? Wendy asked smilingly. In a few more days, answered Zhou Mingrui vaguely. As Wendy took the rye bread, she sighed. He sure is a hard-working lad. He will have a good wife. Upon saying this, the corners of her lips curled up as she said playfully, All is good now. You have already graduated. You are a history graduate of our Koei University O, oh, you will soon be able to earn money. You should not be staying in the apartment you are currently living in. At the very least, you should have a bathroom you can call your own. Mrs. Smyron, you seem to be a young and energetic woman today. All Zhou Mingrui could do was respond with a dry smile. If Klein were to successfully pass his interview and become a lecturer at Tianjin University, it was true that his family would immediately be pushed up to a higher socioeconomic status. In his memory fragments, he had once fantasized about renting a bungalow in the suburbs. There would be five or six rooms, two bathrooms, a huge balcony upstairs, two rooms, a dining room, a living room, a kitchen, a bathroom, and an underground storage room on the first floor. This was not a wishful dream. Even a lecturer on probation at Tianjin University would have a weekly salary of two gold pounds. After the probationary period, the salary would be raised to three gold pounds and ten soli. One had to know that despite working for so many years, Klein's brother, Benson, only had a weekly salary of one pound and ten soli. Ordinary workers at a factory did not even get a pound or, at best, a little more and rent for a bungalow was about 19 soli to 1 pound and 18 soli. This is the difference between earning 3 to 4 thousand yuan and earning 14 to 15 thousand yuan a month. Xiu Mingrui mumbled to himself. However, all of this was under the premise that he passed either the Tianjin University or Baklun University interviews. There were not many other opportunities. People without any connections were unable to get recommendations to become a public servant and those who studied history were more limited in job opportunities. There was not much demand for private consultants from the aristocrats, banks, or industrial magnates. Taking into account that the knowledge Klein grasped was fragmented and incomplete, Zhou Mingrui felt awkward and guilty towards Mrs. Smyron's expectations of him. No, I have always been this young, answered Wendy humorously. As she spoke, she packed the sixteen rye bread she had weighed into the brown paper bag that Zhou Mingrui had brought. She stretched out her right hand and said, Nine pence. Every rye bread weighed about half a pound as differences were inevitable. Nine pence? Wasn't it eleven pence two days ago? Zhou Mingrui asked subconsciously. It cost fifteen pence the month before the previous month. You have to thank the people who protested on the streets for the repeal of the Grain Act, said Wendy as she shrugged. Xiu Mingrui nodded in vague acknowledgement. Klein's memories regarding this were incomplete. All he remembered was that the core tenet of the Grain Act was to protect the prices of domestic agriculture products. Once the prices rose to a certain level, grain imports from southern nations like Fainapotter, Mason, Lenberg were stopped. Why would people protest the act? Without saying much, Zhou Mingrui, afraid he would end up pulling out the revolver, carefully took out his notes and handed one of them over to Mrs. Smyron. He was given three copper pence in change. 
Stuffing them into his trouser pocket, he took the paper bag containing the bread and headed for the lettuce and meat market across the street. He was working hard for the mutton stew with peas his sister had exhorted. There was a municipal square at the intersection of Iron Cross Street and Daffodil Street. Many tents were erected there, and clowns dressed in odd and funny attires were distributing flyers. There's a circus performance tomorrow night? Zhou Mingrui glanced at the flyers in the hands of others as he read their contents under his breath. Melissa would definitely like it. However, how much is the entrance fee? With that thought, Zhou Mingrui went closer. Just as he was about to ask a clown with a red and yellow painted face, a horsewoman's voice sounded from beside him. Would you like to try a divination? Xiao Mingrui subconsciously turned his head and saw a woman wearing a pointed hat and a long black dress standing in front of a short tent. Her face was smeared with red and yellow paint and her eyes were a profound grayish blue. No, Xiao Mingrui shook his head in response. He did not have the spare cash for divination. The woman laughed and said, My tarot divination is very accurate. Tarot. Xiao Mingrui was instantly dumbfounded. This pronunciation was almost identical to the tarot cards on Earth. And tarot cards from Earth were a set of cards used for divination. They just had graphics that represented different omens. Wait. He suddenly recalled the origins of tarot divination in this world. It did not originate from the seven orthodox gods nor was it an ancient legacy. Instead, it was created by the Intus Republic's consul of that era, Roselle Gustav, more than 170 years ago. This Mr. Roselle invented the steam engine, improved the sailing boat, overthrew the Intus Kingdom's imperial rule, and was recognized by the god of craftsmanship. He also became the first consul of the Intus Republic. Later, he invaded other nations and placed Lenberg and other nations under his protection. He made the Lowland Kingdom, Fainapotter, Faisak Empire, and other powerful northern continent nations bow down to the Intus Republic. Following that, the Republic was then changed to an empire and he became the self proclaimed Emperor Caesar. It was during Roselle's rule that the Church of Craftsmanship received its first public holy revelation since the fifth epoch. Ever since, the god of craftsmanship was changed to the god of steam and machinery. Roselle also invented tarot divination. He also established the contemporary system of paper-based cards and their playstyles. There were many familiar styles that Zhou Mingrui was familiar with, such as Upgrade, Fighting the Landlord, Texas Poker, and Quint. In addition, the marine fleets he sent out discovered a sea route that led to the southern continent through the stormy and turbulent seas. This also began the era of colonialism. Unfortunately, he was betrayed in his old age. In the year 1198 of the Fifth Epoch, he was assassinated by the combined forces of the Church of the Eternal Blazing Sun, the former Intus royal family, the Sauron family, and other aristocrats. He eventually died in the White Maple Palace. This. To recall such general knowledge suddenly made him facepalm. Could this be a transmigration senior? With this in mind, Zhou Mingrui was intrigued to see what tarot cards looked like. Therefore, he nodded at the pointy hat woman with the painted face and said, If the. Well. Price is reasonable, I'll give it a try. The woman immediately said with a laugh, Sir, you are the first one here today, so it's on the house. Chapter 5 Ritual Free? Free things cost the most. Xiao Mingrui silently mumbled and decided that he would not purchase any additional services whatsoever. He would firmly refuse them all. If you are really that capable, try divining that I transmigrated here. With this in mind, Xiao Mingrui followed behind the woman whose face was painted red and yellow, stooping low to enter the low tent. The tent's interior was extremely dark, illuminated only by several beams of light that managed to seep inside. A table covered with paper cards could be made out faintly in the low illumination. The woman with the sharp pointy hat was not affected by this at all. Her long black dress glided as though it was moving over water while she went around to the table. She sat on the opposite side and lit a candle. The dim yellow light flickered causing the inside of the tent to appear bright and dark at the same time. 
it instantly added a much more mysterious feel to the atmosphere. Xiao Mingrui sat down quietly, his gaze sweeping over the tarot cards on the table where he discovered familiar cards like the Magician, the Emperor, the Hanged Man, and Temperance, etc. Could Roselle have been a senior? I wonder if he was also a fellow countryman of mine. Xiao Mingrui mumbled to himself subconsciously. Before he could finish looking at the open cards on the table, the woman who claimed to have accurate divinations had already reached out her hands to gather all of the cards together. She stacked them into a deck and pushed it in front of him. Shuffle the cards first and cut the deck, the circus fortune teller said in a muted voice. Me? Shuffle? Xiao Mingrui asked reflexively. The yellow and red paint on the fortune teller's face squirmed together as she revealed a slight smile, saying, Of course, everyone's destiny can only be unraveled by themselves. I only serve as a reader of it. Xiao Mingrui immediately questioned her warily, This reading does not require additional fees, right? As a keyboard folklorist, I've already seen too many of such tricks. The fortune teller was visibly taken aback before finally saying muffledly, It's free. Xiao Mingrui, relieved, stuffed the revolver further back into his pocket. Thereafter, he calmly reached out his two hands to shuffle and cut the deck skillfully. It's done. He placed the already shuffled tarot cards in the middle of the table. The fortune teller clasped the cards with both her hands and carefully looked at cards for a while. Then, she suddenly opened her mouth and said, I'm sorry, I forgot to ask, but what would you like to ask about? Back when he was wooing his first love, Zhou Mingrui had also done research on tarot cards. He asked unhesitatingly, past, present, and future. This was a type of divination as part of tarot card interpretation, three cards when open sequentially symbolized one's past, present, and future. The fortune teller nodded first, then curled her lips to reveal a smile and said, then please reshuffle the deck. You can only truly get the cards you want if you know what you would like to ask about. Were you fooling me just now? Do you have to be this petty? Didn't I only ask a few times if this would be a free service? Xiao Mingrui's cheeks twitched a little. He took a deep breath and took the tarot deck back to reshuffle and cut it. There won't be any problems this time, right? He placed the already cut deck back onto the table. No problem. The fortune teller reached out her fingers and picked a card from the top of the deck. Then she placed it on the left side of Zhou Mingrui. Her voice was going lower and lower as she spoke, This card symbolizes your past. This card symbolizes your present. The fortune teller placed the second card right in front of Zhou Mingrui. Then, she picked the third card and put it on the right side of Zhou Mingrui. This card symbolizes the future. All right. Which card would you like to see first? The fortune teller raised her head up after completing her placement of the cards and gazed deeply at Zhou Mingrui with her grayish blue eyes. I'll have a look at the present first, Zhou Mingrui said after giving it some thought. The fortune teller nodded slowly and flipped over the tarot card that was directly in front of Zhou Mingrui. A colorfully dressed character was depicted on this card, wearing splendid headgear with a stick over his shoulder. There was a bindle hanging on the end of the stick and a puppy was following behind him. It was numbered zero. The fool, the fortune teller lightly read out the name of the card with her grayish blue eyes affixed on Zhou Mingrui. The fool? The zero card of tarot? A start? A fresh beginning with all kinds of possibilities? Zhou Mingrui was not even considered an amateur enthusiast of tarot, so he could only make a rough interpretation based on his own impressions of tarot. Just as the fortune teller was about to say something, the cloth curtains of the tent were suddenly lifted open. The ray of sunlight that shone in was so blinding that it caused the back facing Zhou Mingrui to instinctively narrow his eyes. Why are you impersonating me again? It's my job to handle the divination for people, a woman's voice growled angrily. Return to your post quickly. You must remember that you're just an animal trainer. An animal trainer? Xiao Mingrui's eyes had already adapted to the light by now. He saw a similar-looking woman who was also wearing a sharp pointy hat and a black dress, with her face painted in red and yellow as well. The only difference was that she was taller and had a slimmer physique. 
the woman who was seated in front of him immediately stood up and said disgruntledly, Don't mind this, it's just that I like doing this. But I have to say, my divination and interpretation can be really accurate sometimes. I'm serious. She spoke and lifted up her dress to go around from the side of the table before quickly trotting away from the tent. Sir, would you like me to interpret your cards for you? The real fortune teller looked at Zhou Mingrui and asked with a smile. Zhou Mingrui's lips twitched and asked her sincerely, Is it free? No, the real fortune teller answered. Then forget it. Zhou Mingrui pulled his hands back and put them into his pockets. He clutched his revolver and money before stooping again to exit the tent. Damn. He actually got an animal trainer to be his fortune teller? Was an animal trainer who didn't want to be a fortune teller not a good clown? Xiu Mingrui very quickly put this matter behind him. He spent seven pence at the lettuce and meat market for a pound of not so great mutton. Then, he also bought some tender broad beans, cabbage, onions, potatoes, and other items. Together with the bread that he bought earlier, he spent a total of 25 copper pennies, which converted to two soli and one pence. There is really not enough to go around for spending. Poor Benson. Not only had Zhou Mingrui spent the two notes that he had brought with him, but it was also necessary for him to top it up with the one penny he had in his pocket. He just sighed and did not think further about it as he hurried back home. With the staple food, he could now carry out the luck enhancement ritual. After the second floor tenants gradually left, Zhou Mingrui was still in no hurry to carry out the ritual. Instead, he translated the the immortal Lord of Heaven and Earth for blessings and related phrases into the ancient Faisak language, as well as the Lowan language. He was intending to try the ritual again the next day in those local languages if the original incantation did not take effect. After all, he had to take into consideration the differences between the two worlds. In Rome, do as the Romans do. As for translating it into an ancient ritual prayer that used the dedicated Hermes language, Xiu Mingrui had a difficult time completing it due to his lack of vocabulary. After readying everything, he finally took out the four loaves of rye bread. He placed one in the corner where the coal stove was originally, one at the bottom inner side of the dress mirror, one at the top of the cupboard where two walls met, and one at the right side of the study table where miscellaneous items were kept. With a deep breath, Xiu Mingrui came to the center of the room and spent a few minutes to calm himself. Then, he took a solemn step forward and went in a counterclockwise direction in the shape of a square. When he took the first step, he chanted in a low whisper, The immortal Lord of heaven and earth for blessings. The second step, he sincerely chanted, The sky Lord of heaven and earth for blessings. The third step, Zhou Mingrui breathed out a whisper. The exalted the arch of heaven and earth for blessings. At the fourth step, he spat out a foul breath and meditated in concentration. The celestial worthy of heaven and earth for blessings. When he returned back to the original spot, Zhou Mingrui closed his eyes and waited in his place for an outcome. He had some anticipation in him, some unease, some hope, and some fear. Could he make it back? Was there going to be any effect? Could there be some unexpected situation? The darkness in front of him was tainted with the crimson light of hope. Zhou Mingrui's thoughts were swirling in his head and he was finding it difficult to quell it. It was at this time that he suddenly felt the surrounding air seem to stop, becoming thick and mysterious. Immediately after, a low whisper could be heard beside his ears that sounded at times real, at times sharp, at times imaginary, at times alluring, at times maniacal, and at times crazy. He clearly did not understand the murmuring that went on, but Zhou Mingrui still couldn't help himself from wanting to listen to it and distinguish what it was saying. His head was in pain again. It was so painful that it felt like someone had stuck a steel drill rod into it. Zhou Mingrui only felt like his head was going to explode. His thoughts were filled with psychedelic colors. He knew that something was wrong and tried to open his eyes. However, he wasn't even able to complete such a simple action. His entire body was getting tighter and tighter and it felt like he could just break apart at any time. At this time, a self-mocking thought came up in Zhou Mingrui's mind, if you wouldn't die if you didn't court death. He could no longer bear it. 
Just as his mind was going to break, the murmuring of voices faded away and his surroundings became very quiet. The mood was an erratic one. It was not only the mood, Zhou Mingrui felt his own body going through the same sensations as well. He tried once more to open his eyes, an extremely easy task this time. A gray fog appeared over his eyes, haziness, vague, and endless. What's with this situation? Zhou Mingrui suddenly looked around him and then lowered his head down to discover that he was floating at the edge of an endless fog. The fog was flowing like water and was dotted with a lot of crimson stars. Some of them were enormous while others were tiny. There was a sense of them being hidden in the deep depths, while others floated over the surface of this water-like fog. Looking at the seemingly holographic sight, Zhou Mingrui reached out his right hand in a half-confused, half-exploring manner to try to touch the crimson star that was seemingly floating on the surface. He was trying to find a way to leave this place. When his hand touched the surface of that star, a watermark suddenly appeared from within his body and agitated the stars into a crimson burst. It looked like a dreamlike burning of flames. Xiu Mingrui got a fright from it. He retracted his right hand in a panic, but accidentally touched yet another crimson star. As a result, this star burst with splendid light as well. In turn, Zhou Mingrui felt his mind empty and his spirit dissipated. In the Lowen Kingdom's capital, Backlund. Inside a luxurious looking villa at the Royal District. Audrey Hall sat in front of a dresser. The markings on it were antiquated and there was a cracked bronze mirror on the surface. Mirror, mirror, awaken. In the name of the Hall family, I command you to awaken. She switched between many different sayings, but there was no reaction from the mirror at all. After more than ten minutes, she finally chose to give up and pouted her lips in grievance. She said in a soft murmur, Father was indeed lying to me. He always tells me that this mirror was the treasure of the Solomon Empire's Black Emperor, and that it is an extraordinary item. Her voice trailed off. The bronze mirror which rested on the dresser suddenly glowed with a crimson light that shrouded her completely. In the Sonia Sea, a three-masted sailboat that looked like an obvious relic was navigating through a storm. Alger Wilson stood on deck, his body undulating with the currents at sea, maintaining his balance easily. He wore a robe embroidered with lightning patterns, and in his hand was a quirky-shaped glass bottle. Bubbles billowed inside the bottle at times, frost turned into snow at times, and signs of gusting wind could be seen at times. Still short on the ghost shark's blood. Alger murmured. Then at this moment, a crimson burst appeared in the space between the glass bottle and the surface of his palm. In an instant, it enveloped the surroundings as well. In the fog of gray mist, Audrey Hall regained her sight. She started reckoning the situation in a state of horror and confusion when she noticed the blurry image of a man on the opposite side of her doing the same as well. Immediately after, the both of them discovered another mystery person standing not far from them who was shrouded in a gray mist. The mysterious person was none other than Zhou Mingrui. He was similarly dumbfounded. Sir, where is this? Audrey and Alger were startled at first, falling silent in the process. Then, they immediately started speaking in unison. What are you planning on doing? Chapter 6, Beyonder Not only did they speak the same Lowen language, they also shared the same grim and tense vibes. Where am I? What do I plan to do here? I would like to know too. Calming himself down, Zhou Mingrui silently repeated the questions posed by the two. What left the deepest impression on him were neither the sentences formed by words nor the meanings behind them, but the display of bewilderment, vigilance, panic, and reverence by the couple. For some baffling reason, two people had been mysteriously dragged into this world surrounded by gray fog. As the perpetrator, Zhou Mingrui was already feeling abnormally dumbfounded and startled, let alone the couple who was pulled into this mess completely passively. For them, such events and encounters might already be beyond their imaginations, right? Momentarily, Zhou Mingrui thought of two options. The first option was feigning victimhood to hide his true identity, and in turn gain a considerable amount of trust. 
he could then take a wait-and-see approach and take advantage of his circumstances where necessary. The other option was to maintain his mysterious identity in the eyes of the couple. He could then affect the subsequent development while gleaning valuable information from them. Without the luxury of time to deliberate over the situation, he grasped hold of the thought that flashed across his mind. He made an immediate decision to try out the second idea. Exploit the psychological state of the others to gain the greatest advantage for himself. After a few seconds of silence in the fog, Zhou Mingrui chuckled. With a low but not heavy tone, he calmly spoke as though he was replying to the polite greetings from the visitors, an attempt. An attempt. An attempt? Audrey Hall looked at the mysterious guy veiled in the grayish-white fog, and the only thought was that whatever was happening was absurd, funny, horrifying, and weird. She was at the dressing table inside her bedroom only moments ago. But just by turning around, she had come to this place that was filled with gray fog. How inconceivable! Audrey took a breath, revealing an impeccable, courteous smile. She asked in a somewhat perturbed way, Sir, is the attempt over? Might you permit our return? Alger Wilson also had the intentions to probe Zhou Mingrui in a similar fashion, but his rich experience made him statelier. He held back his impulse and only took on the role of a silent onlooker. Zhou Mingrui looked at the questioner. Looking through the hazy mist, he could roughly see the silhouette of the person in question. It was a tall girl with smooth blonde hair, but her exact countenance could not be seen clearly. He did not rush to reply to the girl's question but turned around to look at the man. He had messy dark blue hair, as well as a medium stature that was not considered stout. Xiu Mingrui suddenly realized something. Once he became stronger or had a deeper understanding of the foggy world, perhaps it was possible for him to see through the fog and discern the girl and the man. In this situation, they are the visitors, and I'm the master. After changing his mindset, Zhou Mingrui instantly noticed details that he had neglected earlier on. The girl with a melodious voice and the mature, withdrawn man both looked considerably incorporeal. Tainted by a faint crimson red, they resembled a projected image of the two crimson red stars beyond the gray fog. This projection was based on the connection between the crimson red and himself, an intangible connection that only he himself could realistically grasp hold of. The projection would disappear once the connection is cut, and the couple would then return. Xiu Mingrui nodded mildly and looked at the blonde, chuckling. Of course, if you make a formal request, you can return this very moment. When she did not identify any ill intention from his tone, Audrey heaved a sigh of relief. She believed that since a gentleman who was capable of such miraculous things had given his word, he would definitely abide by it stringently. With her mind somewhat mollified, she surprisingly was in no hurry to request her leave. She rolled her varied eyes left and right, which sparkled with an abnormal radiance. She said in an anxious, anticipative and tempted manner, This is such a wonderful experience. Yes, I have always been hoping that something like this would happen. I mean, I like mysteries and supernatural miracles. No, my point is, what I mean is that, sir, what can I do to become a beyonder? She got more excited as she spoke, so much so that she was fumbling over her words. The dream that sprouted in her as a result of listening to thrilling fantasies as told by her elders finally saw the possibility of being materialized. However, with just a few words, she had already forgotten all her previous fears and horrors. Good question. I would also like to know the answer. Xiu Mingrui complained inwardly. He started to ponder on an answer to the question to maintain his unfathomable image. At the same time, he felt that it was quite unbecoming of him to talk while standing. Shouldn't he be in a palace, sitting at the head of a long table, and on a mysterious high-backed chair engraved with ancient patterns, while silently observing his visitors? As soon as this thought surfaced, the gray fog started to churn, giving both Audrey and Alger a shock. In an instant, they saw a number of towering stone pillars around them. Above them was a vast dome that encapsulated them. This entire edifice looked magnificent, grand and lofty, just like a legendary palace for giants. Directly under the dome where the gray fog gathered, a long, bronze table appeared with ten high-back chairs on either side in a symmetrical arrangement, 
along with a chair on each of the two ends of the long table the back of each chair dazzled and shone faintly with crimson red, drawing the outlines of weird constellations that differed from reality. Audrey and Alger sat face to face, sitting next to the seat of honor. The girl looked to her sides, and could not help but mumble, how fascinating. It is certainly fascinating. Xiu Mingrui extended his right hand and caressed the edge of the bronze table a little while maintaining an unperturbed expression. Alger inspected the surroundings, and after a few seconds of silence, he suddenly opened his mouth and answered Audrey's question in place of Zhou Mingrui. Are you from Lowen? If you want to become a Beyonder, join the churches of either the Evernight Goddess, the Lord of Storms, or the God of Steam and Machinery. The majority of us will not meet a beyonder our entire lives. This has caused churches, and even some clergymen within some of the biggest churches, to suspect the same. While this is the case, I am certain to tell you that beyonders still exist in courts, tribunals, and execution agencies. They are still fighting against the dangers that grow in the dark, only that their numbers are much fewer as compared to before and during the early days of the Iron Age. Zhou Mingrui listened attentively but he tried his best to present himself as paying little attention to Alger's words, much like how he was listening to kids telling stories. Relying on Klein's fragmented general knowledge of history, Zhou Mingrui knew clearly that the Iron Age referred to the current epoch, which was the fifth epoch that began 1,349 years ago. Audrey silently listened to Alger finish his sentence before sighing. Mister, I know all about what you just said, I even know more than that including the Nighthawks, the Mandated Punishers, and the Machinery Hive Mind, but I don't want to lose my freedom. Alger gave a low-sounding laugh, and said vaguely, you can't become a Beyonder without sacrifices. If you don't consider joining churches and accepting their given challenges, you can only seek the royal families and the few nobles with family histories of more than a thousand years. If not, you can rely on your luck to search for clandestine evil organizations. Audrey puffed her cheeks subconsciously and looked around in a fluster. After confirming that both the mysterious man and Alger did not notice her tick, she pressed, Are there no other solutions? Alger sank into silence. About half a minute later, he turned around to look at the mysterious man who was watching the two of them in silence. Realizing that Zhou Mingrui had no plans to make any comment, he looked back at Audrey and said with deliberation, I have two sets of Sequence 9 potion formulas. Sequence 9? Xiu Mingrui muttered to himself. Really? Which two sets? Audrey clearly knew what the Sequence 9 potion formulas meant. Alger leaned back slightly, and replied unhurriedly, As you know, humanity can only depend on potions to become real beyonders, while the names of potions come from the blasphemy slate. After constant translations into Jotun, Elvish, Ancient and Modern Hermes, and Ancient Faisak, they have undergone changes to match the day and age of that era. The essence is not in their names, but whether they portray the core characteristics of the potions. I have a Sequence 9 potion named Sailor. It enables you to have excellent balancing capabilities. Even if you were on a boat in a rainstorm, you will be able to walk about freely as though you were on land. You will also gain immense strength and illusory scales under your skin. They will enable you to swim like a fish and be difficult to catch. You will move agilely underwater just like marine animals. Even without any equipment, you will be able to easily submerge underwater for at least 10 minutes. Sounds great. The Keepers of the Seas from the Lord of Storms? It was called by that name in the past. Alger did not pause and continued. The second Sequence 9 potion is called Spectator. Although I am not sure what it was called in the past. This set of potions enables you to have an exceptionally sharp mind with acute observational abilities. I believe you can understand what Spectator means from watching operas and plays. Just like an audience, spectators judge the actors in the secular world, catching a glimpse of the real thoughts of them through their emotions, conduct, and mantras. At this point, Alger emphasized, you must remember, regardless of whether you are at an extravagant banquet or a crowded street, spectators can only be spectators forever. Audrey's eyes shone as she listened, and spoke after a long while, why? Alright, this is a follow-up question. I, 
I think I have fallen in love with this feeling, of being a spectator. How can I get this potion's formula? What can I use to trade with you for it? Alger looked like he was already prepared as he said in a deep voice, the blood of ghost sharks, at least 100 milliliters of it. Audrey nodded her head excitedly, but subsequently asked worriedly, if I can get it, and I'm saying if, how do I hand it to you? How can you promise me that you can give the potion's formula to me in return for the ghost shark's blood, as well as the authenticity of the formula? Alger said calmly, I'll give you an address. I'll mail the formula to you, or tell you directly here, once I receive the blood of the ghost shark. As for promises, I think that both you and I can feel assured under the witness of the mysterious sir. As he said this, he swept his eyes towards Zhou Mingrui who was sitting up straight at the seat of honor. Sir, the fact that you brought us here shows that you have tremendous strength unimaginable to us. Neither one of us would dare violate a promise with you as a witness. That's right. Audrey's eyes sparkled and agreed with excitement. From her perspective, the mysterious gentleman who had unimaginable abilities was definitely an authoritative witness. How could I or the guy opposite me dare trick him? Audrey half turned her body and looked at Zhou Mingrui earnestly. Sir, please be the witness of our trade. At that moment, she then realized that she was all too impolite, having forgotten all along to ask a particular question. She asked hurriedly, Sir, how should we address you? Alger nodded slightly, and echoed the same question in a serious manner, Sir, how should we address you? Xiu Mingrui was taken aback. He gently wrapped his fingers on the bronze table. The contents of the earlier divination flashed across his mind suddenly. He leaned back, withdrew his right hand, and crossed his ten fingers, placing them below his chin. He gave the duo a faint smile. You can address me as. Upon saying this, he paused for a moment. He said amiably and calmly, the fool. Chapter 7, Code Names You can address me as the fool. The simple answer soon emanated through the grand hall and dissipated into the fog. However, the voice kept resonating in Audrey's and Alger's hearts, stirring up one ripple after another. They never expected such a designation, but they felt that he was deserving of it. The designation perfectly embodied his image as someone mysterious, powerful, and bizarre. After a few seconds of silence, Audrey stood up, held up her skirt slightly and bent her knees, curtsying to Zhou Mingrui. Honorable Mr. Fool, would you please permit me to take the liberty of requesting you to be the witness of our trade? It's nothing. Zhou Mingrui's mind word as he answered in a way that matched his status. It's our honor, Mr. Fool. Alger stood up as well. He bent his back slightly with his right palm over his chest. Xiu Mingrui lowered his right palm and smiled. Continue, the both of you. Alger nodded and sat back down before looking at Audrey. If you can obtain the ghost shark's blood, get someone to send it to the Warrior and Sea Bar at Pelican Street, in the White Rose Borough of Pritz Harbor. Tell the boss, Williams, that it's what the captain wants. Once I acknowledge receipt, will you be giving me an address to mail the potion formula to, or do you want me to tell it to you here directly? Audrey thought for a moment before saying with a smile, I will choose the more secure method. Let's do it here, although it's a test of my memory. Since Mr. Fool had agreed to bear witness for the trade, it also represented that there would be a similar gathering the next time. With this in mind, she suddenly turned her head as she looked at Zhou Mingrui with sparkling eyes. With a tone of interest, she suggested, Mr. Fool, would you mind making a few more attempts like this? Alger listened to her suggestion calmly, he was tempted by the suggestion as well. He hurriedly echoed, Mr. Fool, don't you find such gatherings interesting? Although your powers exceed our imaginations, there has to be certain domains that you don't understand or excel in. The person across me is obviously a young lady of lofty stature. I also have my unique set of experiences, insights, mediums, and resources. Perhaps there will come a day when both of us can help you complete something trivial that might be inconvenient for you. From his point of view, the fact that he had been pulled into this space without any warning or any means to resist meant that the mysterious Mr. Fool was in control. 
participating in the gatherings was not necessarily something he could refuse. Therefore, it was better to reap the benefits of this encounter as much as he could to make up for his passive and disadvantaged state. The trio at the long table had different backgrounds, resources, information channels, and comprehension of the mystical domain. If they interacted and enjoyed some limited cooperation, they could produce unpredictable and immeasurable effects. The resource trade that had just been negotiated was one example. Another example would be if he wished to kill someone. He could easily request the gathering's members who did not appear to be related to him both on the surface and in reality for help. He could perfectly misdirect any investigators. A young lady of lofty stature. Was my behavior and accent that obvious? Audrey stared blankly, mouth slightly agape, but she soon jolted back to her senses and nodded her head without any hesitation. Mr. Fool, I think it's a very good suggestion. As long as this gathering becomes regular, you can totally leave certain things that are inconvenient for you to us. Of course, it has to be something within our capacities. From the moment he heard the suggestion, Zhou Mingrui was already weighing the pros and cons. More gatherings definitely allowed him to gain more knowledge of the secrets of the Beyonders or other mysteries, a boon for his transmigration back. For example, it was likely that the potion formula would appear at the next gathering because of the spectators. Similarly, the information he gained was bound to be helpful for his present life. However, more gatherings meant it was easier to expose himself. Indeed, regardless of the world, there is no such thing as a free lunch. Zhou Mingrui extended his right hand again as he wrapped the side of the long table with his finger gently. Considering the fact that he was in control of the gathering's summoning and dismissal, any threat of exposure was within the confines of his control. The pros clearly exceeded the cons, so Zhou Mingrui rapidly made a decision. He stopped his rapping as he smiled at the anticipative and perturbed gazes of the duo. I'm a person who likes a fair and equal exchange. Your help will not go unrewarded. Every Monday at three in the afternoon, try your best to be alone. After I make a few more attempts and figure out certain things, perhaps you can apply for a leave of absence ahead of time. You will no longer need to worry about being in inappropriate situations. This was a form of agreement to Alger's and Audrey's suggestions. Audrey had just turned 17. Having been taking care of her entire life, she had the character of a young girl. Therefore, she could not help but clench her fist and gradually pump it in front of her chest when she heard the fool's reply. Without waiting for Alger to say a word, Audrey said in excitement, her eyes glowing, then, shall we give ourselves code names? After all, we can't use our real names for conversation. Although I might not be able to deceive Mr. Fool regarding my true identity, the person opposite me poses some danger. I must not let him know who I am. Good idea, answered Zhou Mingrui in a simple and relaxed manner. Audrey's mind immediately began whirring as she aired her thoughts as they came to her. You are Mr. Fool which is derived from tarot cards. Then, as a fixed, long-term, and secret of gathering, we should be uniform in our designations. Yes, I'll also choose one from the tarot cards. Her tone slowly turned joyous. I've decided. My designation shall be justice. It was one of the twenty-two major arcana tarot cards. What about you, mister? Audrey cheekily smiled at her partner sitting across her. Alger frowned slightly before relaxing it immediately. The Hanged Man. It was another major arcana card. All right, then we can be considered as the founding members of the Tarot Club. Audrey was the first to blurt it out happily, only to look fearfully at the fog-concealed Zhou Mingrui. Will that be all right, Mr. Fool? Zhou Mingrui shook his head in amusement. You can decide on such trivial matters by yourselves. Thank you. Audrey was clearly thrilled. Following that, she looked at Alger. Mr. Hangman, can you repeat the address again once more? I'm afraid that my memories will fail me. No problem. Alger was very pleased with Audrey's seriousness as he repeated the address once more. After repeating it to herself silently thrice, Audrey said again in excitement, I heard that tarot cards were invented by Emperor Roselle as a game. In fact, 
doesn't it come equipped with the power to divine the future? No. Most of the time, divination stems from oneself. Everyone has something spiritual about themselves, allowing them to attune to the spiritual world and connect to information about themselves at an even higher level. However, ordinary folks are unable to notice this, much less be able to interpret the signs they receive. This information will present itself with the help of divination tools. Let me raise a simple example, dreams and dream interpreters. Alger took a glance at Zhou Mingrui and seeing no response from him, he refuted Audrey's claim. Tarot cards are, in fact, such a tool. It uses more symbolism and more logical elements to help us in conveniently and accurately interpreting the signs. Although Zhou Mingrui appeared indifferent, he was actually listening very carefully. It was only at this point that his empty mind slowly became heavy as his head began to feel a throbbing pain. Got it. Audrey nodded in agreement. Following that, she emphasized, that's not what I meant. I'm not doubting the tarot cards, but I heard that Emperor Roselle had actually created another set of cards, secret and mysterious ones. They were paper cards which symbolized a particular unknown power. There were a total of 22 cards that he completed. Later on in life, he referenced them to create the 22 major arcana tarot cards which are used as a gaming tool. Was what I said correct? She looked at Zhou Mingrui as though she was attempting to get an answer from the mysterious Mr. Fool. All Zhou Mingrui did was smile without saying a word. He cast his gaze at the hangman as though he was putting him to the test. Alger subconsciously straightened his back and said in a deep voice, That's right. It is said that Emperor Roselle had seen the blasphemy slate and that set of paper cards contained the profound mysteries of the twenty-two paths of the divine. Twenty-two paths of the divine. Repeated Audrey with alarming tone. At that moment, Zhou Mingrui's headache intensified. He felt that his invisible connection with the crimson stars and grayish white fog was beginning to falter. All right, that will be all for today's gathering, he said in a deep voice after making the decision immediately. By your will. Alger bowed his head respectfully. By your will. Audrey mimicked the hanged man. She still had many questions and thoughts, thus, she was unwilling to have it end so soon. As Zhou Mingrui severed the connection, he said with a smile, Let us look forward to the next gathering. The stars brightened once more as the crimson light receded like water. Just as Audrey and Alger heard Mr. Fool's words, their figures turned into a blur as they phased away. In a second, the projection shattered as the gray fog restored its silence. As for Zhou Mingrui, he felt himself turning heavy rapidly. His surroundings turned fleeting as his eyes met darkness before changing into dazzling sunlight. He was still standing in the middle of his apartment. It was like a dream. What the heck was that foggy world? Who or what sort of power created the changes that just happened? Zhou Mingrui sighed softly. He was completely puzzled as he walked towards the study desk as though his legs were filled with lead. He picked up the pocket watch he placed outside to determine how much time had passed. Time flowed at the same pace. Xiu Mingrui made a rough judgment. After putting down his pocket watch, he found himself unable to endure the splitting headache any further. He sat on the chair and lowered his head, using his left thumb and middle finger to massage his temples. After a long while, he suddenly let out a sigh and said in Mandarin, from the looks of it, I won't be able to return any time soon. Only the clueless could be fearless. After witnessing such a fascinating event and learning the situation regarding Beyonders and the mysterious world, Zhou Mingrui no longer dared to rashly try the luck enhancement ritual using ancient face sack or Loan language. Who knew what other kinds of situations would happen? Perhaps, it would be more bizarre, horrifying, or even a living hell. At the very least, I should attempt only when I have a deep mastery of mysticism, thought Zhou Mingrui helplessly. Thankfully, the so-called gathering could provide him with help. After another bout of silence, he muttered to himself with a tone of dismay, disappointment, agony, and grief, from this moment forth, I'm Klein. Klein tried his best to refocus his solutions and plans so as to purge the negative emotions in him. Perhaps, he could learn the potion formula for spectator from the side. 
The gathering that just happened sure is fascinating. People who reside in different places across the world can reduce hundreds of kilometers to just mere inches and discuss face to face while supplying each other's needs. Ah, speaking of which, this does sound a little familiar. Klein was stunned for a few seconds before he burst out in laughter. Pressing against his temple, he jested under his breath, wasn't that a social networking platform? Chapter 8, A New Era Whoosh! Howling wind accompanied the downpour. The three-mast sailboat was tossed around by the crests and troughs of the incoming waves, as if it was being toyed by a giant. The crimson glow in Alger Wilson's eyes faded. He found himself still remaining on the deck and nothing appeared to have changed. Almost immediately, the quirky-shaped glass bottle in his palm shattered and the frost within melted into the rain. In seconds, there were no longer any traces left that suggested the existence of the wondrous antique. A hexagonal crystal-like snowflake emerged on Alger's palm. It then faded rapidly until it was seemingly absorbed by the flesh vanishing completely in the process. Alger nodded his head in a hardly noticeable manner, as if he was thinking about something. He remained still and silent for a full five minutes. He turned around and headed for the cabin. As he was about to enter, a man who wore a similar robe embroidered with lightning patterns emerged from inside. This man, who had soft blonde hair, paused and looked at Alger. He held his right fist to his chest and said, May the storm be with you. Alger replied with the same words and gesture. There were no emotions on his rough face which had a well-defined structure. Alger entered the cabin after the greeting and proceeded to the captain's cabin situated at the far end of the corridor. Surprisingly, he did not encounter any sailors on the way. The whole place was as quiet as a graveyard. Behind the door to the captain's cabin, a soft brown carpet overlaid the floor. A bookshelf and a wine rack took the opposite side walls of the room. The books with their yellowish covers and wine bottles with their dark red color looked peculiar under the flickering candlelight. On the desk with the candle, there was a bottle of ink, a quill, a black metallic telescope and a sextant made of brass. Behind the desk sat a pale middle-aged man wearing a captain's hat which had a skull on it. As Alger approached him, he said menacingly, I will not give in. I believe you can do it, Alger said calmly, so calm that it felt like he was commenting on the weather. You! The man seemed to be stunned by the unexpected answer. At this very moment, Alger leaned forward slightly and suddenly dashed across the room until they were only separated by the desk. Pa! Alger tightened his shoulder and reached out his right hand to choke the man. Illusory fish scales appeared on the back of his hand as he crazily mustered more strength to choke the man, giving him no time to respond. Crack! Amid the crisp cracking sound, the man's eyes widened as his body was lifted up. His legs twitched furiously before they soon became motionless. His pupils began to widen as he stared aimlessly. There was a stench from between his legs as his pants gradually turned moist. While lifting the man, Alger lowered his back and strode toward the wall. Bang! He used the man as a shield and smashed forward at the wall. His extremely muscular arm was monstrous. A hole cracked open in the wooden wall, and rain poured in, accompanied by the scent of the ocean. Alger flung the man out of the cabin, straight into the giant waves that resembled mountains. The wind continued to howl in the dark as almighty nature devoured everything. Alger took out a white handkerchief and wiped his right hand carefully before throwing it into the sea as well. He stepped back and waited patiently for company. In less than ten seconds, the blonde man from before rushed in and asked, What happened? The captain has escaped, Alger answered in an annoyed manner as he panted. I didn't know he still had some of his beyonder powers. Damn it, the blonde man cursed softly. He went up to the opening and stared into the distance. However, nothing was visible except for the waves and the rain. Forget it, he was just extra loot, the blonde man said, waving his arm, we will still be rewarded for finding this ghost ship from the Tudor era. Even if he was a keeper of the sea, he would not have hastily dived into the sea under this weather condition. The captain will not be able to survive much longer if the storm continues. 
Alger said, as he nodded in approval. The wooden wall was repairing itself at a discernible rate. He gazed at the wall and turned his head subconsciously towards the rudder and the sail. He was perfectly aware of what was going on behind all the wooden planks. The chief mate, the second mate, the crew, and the sailors were not present. There was no living person on board. Amidst all the emptiness, the rudder and the sail moved eerily by themselves. Alger again pictured the fool who was covered in grayish-white fog inside. He turned back and looked outside at the mighty waves and spoke as though in a reverie while filled with anticipation and awe, a new era has begun. Empress Burrow, Backlund, capital of the Lowen Kingdom. Audrey Hall pinched her cheeks in disbelief of her encounter a while ago. On the dressing table in front of her, the old bronze mirror had shattered into pieces. Audrey cast her gaze downwards and saw the swirling crimson on the back of her hand, it was like a tattoo depicting a star. The crimson gradually faded and disappeared into her skin. Only at this point in time was Audrey certain that it was not a dream. Her eyes twinkled as she grinned. She could not help but stand up before bending down to lift up the hem of her dress. She curtsied towards thin air and started dancing lively. It was the ancient elf dance, the most popular dance among royalty at the moment. She had a bright smile on her face as she moved about gracefully. Knock! Knock! Someone suddenly knocked at her bedroom door. Who is it? Audrey immediately stopped her dance and asked as she tidied her dress to look more elegant. My lady, may I come in? You should start to prepare for the ceremony, Audrey's maidservant asked from outside the door. Audrey looked into a mirror on the dressing table and quickly wiped the smile from her face, leaving only a tiny hint of a smile. She responded gently after she had ensured everything was presentable, come in. The doorknob turned and Annie, her maidservant, pushed in. Oh, it cracked. Annie said as she instantly saw the outcome of the old bronze mirror. Audrey blinked and said slowly, Erm, yes. Susie was here just now. I am sure you know she likes to wreak havoc. Susie was a golden retriever that was not so much of a purebred. It was a gift given to her father, Earl Hall, when he bought a foxhound. Nevertheless, Audrey adored it. You should train it well, Annie said, as she picked up the pieces of the bronze mirror adeptly and with care, lest it hurt her mistress. As she finished tidying up, she asked Audrey with a smile, which dress do you want to put on? Audrey thought for a while and answered, I like the dress designed by Mrs. Guinea for my seventeenth birthday. No, you can't wear the same dress twice to a formal ceremony or others will gossip about and question the Hall family's financial ability, Annie said, shaking her head in disagreement. But I really like it. Audrey insisted in a gentle manner. You can wear it at home or when you attend an event that isn't so formal, Annie said firmly, suggesting that it was not negotiable. Then it will have to be the one with the frilly designs along the sleeves given by Mr. Sadas two days ago, Audrey said as she drew in a gasp inconspicuously, maintaining her sweet smile. You always have such a good taste, Annie said as she stepped back and shouted towards the door, the sixth dressing room. Ah, forget it, I shall fetch it myself. Maidservants began to work. The dress, accessories, footwear, hat, Makeup, and hairstyle, everything had to be taken care of. When it was almost ready, Earl Hall appeared at the door wearing a dark brown waistcoat. He had a hat sharing the same color as his clothes and a nice mustache. His blue eyes were filled with joy, but his loosening muscles, widening waist, and wrinkles were obviously destroying his handsome youth. The most dazzling jewel of Backlund, it is time for our departure, Earl Hall said, knocking at the door twice. Father! Stop calling me that, Audrey protested as she got up with the help of the maidservants. Well then, it's time to set off, my beautiful little princess, Earl Hall said as he bent his left arm, signaling Audrey to hold his arm. Audrey shook her head slightly and said, that is for my mother, Mrs. Hall, the Countess. Then this side, Earl Hall bent his right arm with a smile and said, this is for you, my greatest pride. The Imperial Naval Base Pritz Harbor, Oak Island. When Audrey took her father's arm and walked down the carriage, she was suddenly shocked by the juggernaut in front of her. 
In the military port not far away, there was a huge ship shimmering with metallic reflections. It did not have a sail, leaving only an observatory deck, two towering chimneys, and two turrets at the ends of the ship. It was so majestic and large that the fleet of sails nearby were like newborn dwarfs clustering around a giant. Holy Lord of Storms! Oh, M. Lord! An ironclad warship! Amidst the furor, Audrey was also shocked by this unprecedented miracle created by mankind. It was an ocean miracle that had never been seen before. It took a while for the aristocrats, ministers, and members of parliament to compose themselves. Then, a black spot on the sky started to grow in size until it occupied a third of the sky and entered everyone's view. The atmosphere suddenly became solemn. It was a gigantic flying machine with a beautiful streamlined design hovering in midair. The deep blue machine had airbags made of cotton which were supported by alloy structures that were strong but light. The alloy structure's bottom had openings mounted with machine guns, projectile launchers, and muzzles. The exaggerated humming noise from the ignition steam engine and the tail blades produced a symphony that left everyone amazed. The king's family arrived on their airship, exuding a lofty and indisputable authority. Two swords, each with a ruby crown at the handle, were pointing vertically down and reflected the sunlight on both sides of the cabin. They were the Sword of Judgment emblem which symbolized the Augustus family and has been passed down from the previous epic. Audrey was not yet eighteen, so she had not attended the introductory ceremony, which was an event led by the Queen that marked one's debut into the Backlund social scene, to announce her adult status. Therefore, she could not be nearer to the airship and had to remain silent at the back to watch the entire event. Nevertheless, it did not matter to her. In fact, she was relieved that she did not need to deal with the princes. The miracle that mankind used to conquer the sky touched down gently. The first ones to step down the stairs were the handsome young guards who wore red ceremonial uniforms with white trousers. Decorated with medals, they formed two lines with rifles in hand. They were awaiting the appearances of King George III, his queen, and the prince and princess. Audrey was not new to meeting important people so she showed no interest at all. Instead, she had her attention on the two statue-like black-armored cavalry flanking the king. In this era of iron, steam, and cannons, it was surprising that there was still someone who could bear wearing full armor. The cold metallic luster and the dull black helmet conveyed solemnity and authority. Could they be the higher-order disciplinary paladins? Audrey recalled snippets of a casual conversation among adults. She was curious but did not dare go close. The ceremony commenced with the arrival of the king's family. The incumbent prime minister, Lord Aguisid Negan, went up to the front. He was a member of the Conservative Party and the second non-aristocrat to become the prime minister till this very day. He was given the title of a lord for his great contributions. Of course, Audrey knew more. The main supporter of the Conservative Party was the present Duke of Negan, Pallas Negan, who was the brother of Aguisid. Aguisid was a slender and almost bald 50 plus year old man with a sharp gaze. He surveyed the area before speaking. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe you have witnessed this history making ironclad warship. It has dimensions of 101 by 21 meters. It has an amazing port and starboard design. The armor belt is 457 millimeters thick. The displacement is 10,060 tons. There are four 305 millimeter main cannons, six rapid fire cannons, 12 six pound cannons, 18 six barrel machine guns, and four torpedo launchers. It can reach a speed of 16 knots. It will be the real hegemon. It will conquer the seas. The crowd was roused. The mere descriptions were enough to instill fearful images in them, let alone the fact that the actual thing was right in front of them. Aguisid smiled and spoke a few more lines before saluting the king and requested, Your Majesty, please give it a name. Since it will set sail from Pritz Harbor, it should be named the Pritz, George III responded. His expression showed his delight. The Pritz. The Pritz. The words spread from the Navy Minister and the Admiral of the Imperial Navy to all the soldiers and officers on the deck. 
they all exclaimed in unison, the Pritz. George III ordered the Pritz to set sail for a trial in the midst of the gun salutes and the celebratory atmosphere. Honk! Thick smoke spewed out from the chimneys. The sound from the machinery could be heard faintly beneath the sound of the ship horn. The juggernaut departed from the harbor. Everyone was shocked when the two main cannons at the ship's bow fired at an uninhabited island in its path. Boom! 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 The ground shook as dust shot up into the sky. Shock waves spread out, producing waves in the sea. Satisfied, Aguisid turned back to the crowd and announced, From this day on, doomsday will fall on the seven pirates who call themselves admirals and the four who call themselves kings. They can only shiver in fear. It is the end of their era. Only the ironclad warship will roam the seas no matter whether the pirates have the powers of the beyonders, ghost ships, or cursed ships. Aguisid's chief secretary deliberately asked, Can't they build their own ironclad warships? Some of the nobles and members of parliament nodded, feeling that such a possibility could not be eliminated. Aguisid immediately smiled and shook his head slowly as he answered, Impossible. It will never be possible. Building our ironclad warship required three big coal and steel amalgamators, a scale of more than 20 steel factories, 60 scientists and senior engineers from the Backlund Cannon Academy and Pritz Nautical Academy, two royal shipyards, almost 100 factories for spare parts, an admiralty, a ship building committee, a cabinet, a determined king with excellent foresight, and a great country with an annual steel production of 12 million tons. The pirates will never achieve it. Having said that, he paused and raised his arms before shouting in agitation, Ladies and gentlemen, the era of cannons and warships has dawned upon us. Chapter 9 The Notebook After half an hour of rest, Zhou Mingrui, who now viewed himself as Klein, finally recovered. In the meantime, he found that there were now four black dots on the back of his hand, which happened to form a small square. These four black spots faded and disappeared quickly, but Klein knew that they were still hiding in his body, waiting to be awakened. For spots forming a square, is it in correspondence with the four pieces of staple food at the four corners of the room? Does this mean that in the future, I don't need to prepare the food and can do the ritual and chants immediately? Klein made a guess. This might seem good, but the emergence of the spots was ominous, and things that one lacked understanding of were always scary. The fact that those inexplicable Chinese divinations from Earth could produce effects here, the strange transmigration in his sleep, the mysterious murmurings that almost drove him crazy during the ritual, and the mysterious and trippy gray world whose significance he had no idea of made Klein shiver in the hot weather of June. The oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear, and the oldest and strongest fear is the fear of the unknown. He recalled this saying as he was experiencing the fear of the unknown acutely. There was in him an unprecedented and irresistible urge to make contact with the mysterious domain, to learn more, and to explore the unknown. There was also a contradicting escape mentality within him compelling him to pretend nothing had happened. Intense sunlight shone through the window onto the desk, making it appear as if grains of gold were sprinkled on it. Klein gazed at the desk, feeling as though he had come into contact with warmth and hope. He relaxed slightly and a strong sense of fatigue washed over him. His eyelids were as heavy as lead as they kept closing themselves. It must have been the combined effect of the sleepless night and the tiring encounter. Klein shook his head and pushed himself up with the aid of the desk. He stumbled towards the double-decked bed, completely disregarding the rye bread placed at the four corners of the room. He fell asleep immediately after he lay down. Groan! Groan! Klein was woken up by hunger pangs. When he opened his eyes, he felt rejuvenated. There's still a slight headache. He rubbed his temples and sat up. He was so hungry that he could eat a horse. He returned to the desk while straightening his shirt. He picked up the silver vine leaf pocket watch. Pa! The pocket watch's lid sprang open and the second hand was ticking. Half past twelve. I slept for three hours. Klein put the pocket watch back into his linen shirt pocket while swallowing. In the northern continent, 
There were 24 hours in a day, 60 minutes in an hour, and 60 seconds in a minute. Whether each second passed at the same rate here compared to Earth was unknown to Klein. At this moment, he could not even think of terms such as mysticism, rituals, or the grayish world. His mind was occupied by one thing, food. He would leave thinking after his meals. Only then could he work. Klein picked up the loaves of rye bread from the four corners and wiped off the minute specks of dust on it without any hesitation. He planned on making one of them as lunch. He decided to dig into the offerings because he only had five pence with him and there was a tradition of eating the offerings back in his hometown. After all, there was not any observable change to the bread. It was better to be frugal. Of course, the memory and habits left behind by the original Klein had also played a role. It was a huge waste to use the expensive gas only to light up the room. So, Klein took out a furnace and boiled water with it after adding some coal. He paced around as he waited. Anyone would choke eating those loaves of rye bread without water. Yikes! Life with meat only for dinner is going to be dreadful. No, wait, this is already an exception. Melissa would only allow our meals to have meat twice a week if not for my upcoming interview, Klein thought, as he looked around, hungry. He had nothing better to do. His eyes seemed to turn avaricious when he set his eyes on the pound of mutton in the cupboard. No, I need to wait for Melissa to eat it together, Klein thought as he shook his head and rejected the idea of cooking half of it right now. Although he often ate outside, he had still developed some basic culinary skills, owing to his living in a big city alone. His dishes were not delicious, but they were at least edible. Klein turned his body around so that the mutton would not seduce him. Then, he suddenly realized that he had also bought peas and potatoes in the morning. Potatoes. Klein immediately had an idea. He quickly turned back to the cupboard and took out two potatoes from a tiny pile of them. He first cleaned the potatoes in the public bathroom and then added them into a pot so they were boiled together with the water. After a while, he sprinkled into the water some yellow coarse salt from the spices container he found inside the cupboard. He waited patiently for a few minutes before lifting the pot and pouring the soup into a few cups in a bowl. He took out the potatoes with a fork and placed them on the desk at the end. He blew at the potato as he peeled it bit by bit. The fragrance of boiled potato diffused through the air. It smelled very appetizing. He salivated crazily, the heat could not deter him any longer. Klein took a bite despite having the potato only half peeled. How fragrant! It had a powdery texture and tasted sweet as he chewed. He was instantly filled with emotions and he wolfed down the two potatoes. He even ate some of the skin. Then, he held up the bowl and enjoyed the soup. The pinch of salt and water proved to be thirst-quenching. I really enjoyed eating potatoes this way when I was young. A filled Klein exclaimed in his head. Meanwhile, he tore off a small piece of bread and dipped it into the soup to soften it before eating. Perhaps the ritual was too tiring, Klein ate two loaves of bread which amounted to a whole pound. Klein felt he was finally rejuvenated. He enjoyed the joy of life after he drank the soup before tidying up. Then, he took in the lustrous sunshine happily. He sat back at the desk and began planning. I can't escape. I must think of a way to come into contact with mysticism and become a beyonder as mentioned by Justice and the Hanged Man. I need to overcome the fear of the unknown. The only way now is to wait for the next gathering. I need to see if I can learn the formula of the spectator potion or other things related to mysticism. There are four more days before Monday. Before that, I need to first figure out the problem with Klein. Why did he commit suicide? What happened to him? Unable to transmigrate back and wash his hands of everything, Klein picked up the notebook that lay on the table. He wanted to find hints that could help him regain his lost memory fragments. The original Klein obviously had the habit of taking notes. He also liked to write diaries. Klein was fully aware that the cabinet that supported the desk on the right stored a whole stack of completed notebooks. The book he had began on the 10th of May. Matters regarding his school and mentor, as well as content pertaining to knowledge were at the beginning. May 12th. 
Mr. Asik mentioned that the common language used by the Balam Empire in the southern continent also developed from ancient Faisak, a branch of Jotun. Why is this so? Does this mean that every sentient living being once spoke the same language? No, there has to be a mistake. According to the Revelation of Evernight and the Book of Storms, giants were not the only hegemons of the world in primordial times. There were also elves, mutants, and dragons. Anyways, these are just myths and fantasies. May 16th. Senior Associate Professor Cohen and Mr. Asik discussed the inevitability of the Age of Steam. Mr. Asik opined that it was just a coincidence because if it wasn't for Emperor Roselle, the northern continent would still be wielding swords like the southern continent. Mentor argued that Mr. Asik had placed too much emphasis on the contribution of an individual. He believes that with progress, even if there wasn't an Emperor Roselle, there would be an Emperor Robert. Therefore, the Age of Steam might come late, but eventually come nevertheless. I found little meaning in their discussion. I prefer discovering new things and unraveling the hidden past. Perhaps I am more suited to study archaeology than history. May 29th. Welch found me and told me that he had acquired a notebook from the fourth epoch. Oh my goddess! A notebook from the fourth epoch. He didn't want to ask the archaeology department's students for help so he came to Naya and me to help him decode the contents. How can I refuse? Of course, I can only do it after my graduation defense. I can't afford diverting my attention at this stage. This caught Klein's attention. Compared to the notes about history and viewpoint disagreements, the appearance of a notebook from the fourth epoch might have led to Klein's suicide. The fourth epoch was the epoch before the present Iron Age. Its history was mysterious and incomplete. Due to the fact that very few tombs, ancient cities, and records had been found, archaeologists and historians could only refer to the ambiguous records provided by the seven major churches that centered around their religious teachings to roughly form the original picture. They knew the existence of the Solomon Empire, the Tudor Dynasty, and the Trunsoist Empire. Having set his sights on solving the mystery and restoring history, Klein didn't have much interest in the first three eras, whose roots were closer to legends. He was more interested in the fourth epoch, also known as the Age of the Gods. Hmm, so Klein was concerned for his future career and thus focused on the interview. But it was all futile. Klein could not resist exclaiming. Universities were still very scarce and the majority of students were either from noble or wealthy families. As long as he did not have an extreme mindset, a commoner who had been admitted into university would have been able to build precious social connections through group discussions and networking events despite the prejudice and exclusion from the entrenched social circles. The very generous Welch McGovern was an example. He was the son of a banker from Constant City, mid seashore Lowland Kingdom. He was used to asking Naya and Klein for help because they were always in the same group for work. Without thinking further, Klein continued reading the notebook. June 18. I have graduated. Farewell, Koei University. June 19. I have seen the notebook. By comparing sentence structures and root words, I discover that it is a modified form of ancient Faisak. More precisely, over the course of its thousand-year history, the Faisak language had changed constantly, a little at a time. June 20. We have deciphered the contents of the first page. The author was a member of a family called Antigonus. June 21st. He mentioned the Black Emperor. This is anachronistic with regards to the time this notebook is deduced to be written. Is Professor wrong? Is Black Emperor a common title for every emperor of the Solomon Empire? June 22nd. The Antigonus family apparently had a very high standing in the Solomon Empire. The author mentions that he was making a secret transaction with a person named Tudor. Tudor? Is it related to the Tudor dynasty? June 23rd. I am trying to restrain myself from thinking about the notebook and going to Welch's place. I need to prepare for the interview. It's very important. June 24th. Naya tells me that they have found something new. I think I need to check it out. June 25th. 
From the new decipher content, the author had accepted a mission to visit the nation of the Evernight situated at the summit of the highest peak of the Hornasus mountain range. Oh my goddess! How can a nation exist at the summit of that peak which is over 6,000 meters above sea level? How do they survive? June 26. Are these strange things real? The record ended at this point. Xiaoming Rui transmigrated in the early hours of the 28th. Which means to say that there was indeed an entry for June 27th, it's that line. Everyone will die, including me. Klein flipped to the page he first saw when he arrived, feeling goosebumps while he made the deduction. In order to solve the mystery of the original Klein's suicide, he thought that he should visit Welch and take a look at the ancient notebook. However, with a lot of experience from novels, movies, and TV drama series, he suspected that if they were really related, this visit would be very dangerous. Those who went investigating castles despite knowing that they were haunted served as a warning. However, he had to go since escaping would never solve the problem. It would only make things worse, until it welled over and completely drowned him. Perhaps call the police? But claiming to have committed suicide would be silly, right? Knock! Knock, knock! There was a series of quick and forceful knocks. Klein sat straight up and listened. Knock! Knock, knock! The knocks echoed through the empty hallway. Chapter 10, The Norm Who is it? Klein was thinking about the mysterious suicide of the original owner of this body and the unknown danger he might encounter when he heard the sudden knock on the door. He subconsciously opened the drawer, took out the revolver, and asked vigilantly. The other party was quiet for two seconds before a slightly sharp voice, in all his accent, replied, It's me, Mountbatten, bitch Mountbatten. The voice paused for a moment before adding, the police. Bitch Mountbatten. When Klein heard this name, he immediately thought of the owner of this name. He was the policeman in charge of the street where the apartment was located. He was a rude, brutal, hands-on man. But perhaps, only such a man could be a deterrent for alcoholics, thieves, part-time thieves, villains, and hooligans. And his unique voice was one of his trademarks. Okay, I'll be right there. Klein responded loudly. He had planned to put the revolver back into the drawer but thinking that he had no idea why the police were outside and that they might search the room or do other things, he cautiously ran to the stove where the flames had already been extinguished and put the revolver in it. Then he picked up the coal basket, shook a few pieces into the stove, covered the gun, and finally placed the kettle over the stove to conceal everything. After doing all of that, he tidied up his clothes and quickly approached the door and murmured, Sorry, I just had a nap. Outside the door stood four policemen in black and white checkered uniforms with peak caps. Bitch Mountbatten, the one with a brown beard, coughed and said to Klein, These three inspectors have something to ask you. Inspectors? Klein looked at the shoulder badges of the other three reflexively and found that two of them had three silver hexagons and one had two both of which looked superior to Bitch Mountbatten, who had only three chevrons. As a history student, Klein did little to no research into the ranks of police epaulets, except that Bitch Mountbatten often boasted of being a senior sergeant. So these three are inspectors? Influenced by conversations with Benson, Welch, and his classmates, Klein had the common sense to make way and point into the room. Please come in. How might I help you? The leader of the three inspectors was a middle-aged man with sharp eyes. He seemed to be able to read the mind of a person and make them fearful. His eyes were wrinkled, and the edge of his hat revealed light brown hair. He looked around the room and asked in a deep voice, Do you know Welch McGovern? What's wrong with him? Klein quivered and blurted back. I'm the one asking the questions. The dignified middle-aged police inspector had a stern look in his eyes. The inspector next to him, also wearing three silver hexagons, looked at Klein and smiled gently. Don't be nervous. It's just a routine questioning. This policeman was in his thirties, with a straight nose and gray eyes that, like a lake in an ancient forest that no one visited, gave him an indescribable sense of depth. Klein took a breath and organized his words. 
If you mean Welch McGovern, the graduate of Coe University from Constant, then I'm sure I know him. We are classmates with the same mentor, senior associate Professor Quentin Cohen. In the Lowen Kingdom, professor was not only a professional title, but also a position, just like the combination of professors and department deans on earth. That meant there could only be one professor in a university's department. If an associate professor wanted to become professor, they had to wait for their superior to retire, or force out their superior with their abilities. As talents needed to be retained, the Kingdom's Higher Education Commission had added senior associate professors in the three-level system of lecturers, associate professors and professors after years of observation. This title was given to anyone with high academic achievements or with enough seniority but did not make it to the position of professor. At this point, Klein looked into the eyes of the middle-aged police inspector and thought for a second. To be honest, our relationship is quite good. During this period, I met with him and Naya frequently to interpret and discuss the fourth epic notebook that belonged to him. Inspectors, did something happen to him? Instead of answering, the middle-aged police inspector looked sideways at his gray-eyed colleague. The inspector with the peak cap and ordinary looks replied mildly, I'm sorry, Mr. Welch has passed away. What? Despite having some hunches, Klein could not help but shout out in astonishment. Welch died just like the original owner of this body. That is a little scary. What about Naya? Klein questioned hurriedly. Miss Naya passed away too, the gray-eyed police inspector said quite calmly. Both of them died in Mr. Welch's house. Killed? Klein had a vague guess. Perhaps it was suicide. The gray-eyed inspector shook his head. No, the scene suggests that they committed suicide. Mr. Welch hit the wall with his head many times, covering the wall with blood. Miss Naya drowned herself in a basin. Yes, the kind used to wash your face. That's impossible. Klein's hairs stood on their ends as he seemed capable of imagining the strange scene. A girl kneeling on a chair and burying her face into a basin filled with water. Her soft brown hair swaying in the wind, but her entire person remaining motionless. Welch falling to the ground and staring at the ceiling intently. His forehead in a complete blood-mangled mess, while the traces of the impact on the wall were evident with the streaks of blood. The gray-eyed inspector continued, We believe so too, but the autopsy results in the situation at the scene exclude factors such as drugs and external forces. They, being Mr. Welch and Ms. Naya, showed no signs of struggling. Before Klein could speak again, he stepped into the room and asked, pretending to be casual, when was the last time you saw Mr. Welch or Ms. Naya? As he spoke, he gestured with his eyes to his colleague with two silver hexagons. He was a young police inspector and looked about the same age as Klein. With black sideburns and green pupils, he was good-looking and had a poet's romantic temperament. When he heard the question, Klein thought about it and answered it thoughtfully, it should be June 26th, we were reading a new chapter in the notes. Then, I went home to prepare for my interview on June 30th, ah, uh, the interview was for the history department of Tingen University. Tingen was known as the City of Universities. There were two universities, Tingen and Koei, as well as technical schools, law colleges, and business colleges. It was second only to Backlund, the capital. As soon as he finished, he saw the young police inspector walk towards his desk in the corner of his eye and pick up the notes which resembled more of a diary. Damn! I forgot to hide it. Hey! Klein cried out. The young inspector smiled back at him, but did not stop flipping through his notes, while the gray-eyed inspector explained, this is a necessary procedure. At this time, Bitch Mountbatten and the dignified middle-aged police inspectors were just watching without interrupting or assisting in the search. Where are your search warrants? Klein had intended to question them, but on second thought, the judicial system of the Lowen Kingdom did not seem to have such a thing as search warrants. At least he did not know if there was one. After all, the police force had only been established for fifteen or sixteen years. When the original owner of this body was still a child, they were still called public security officers. Klein couldn't stop it. He watched the young inspector flip through his notes, but the gray-eyed inspector did not ask any questions. 
What is this strange thing? The young police inspector turned to the end of the notes and suddenly asked, And what does this mean? Everyone will die, including me. Isn't it common sense that everyone dies except for deities? Klein was prepared to quibble, but it suddenly occurred to him that he had planned to connect with the police in case of possible danger, but he had no reasons or excuses. He made a decision in less than a second. Putting his hand over his forehead, he answered painfully, I have no idea. I really have no idea. When I woke up this morning, I felt I wasn't quite right, as if I had forgotten something. It's especially true for whatever happened recently. I don't even know why I had written such a sentence. Sometimes, being frank was the best way to solve a problem. Of course, it required skills. There were things that could be said and could not be said, and the order of what was said first mattered. As an expert keyboard warrior, Klein was also good at sophistry. That is ridiculous. Do you think we are fools? Bitch Mountbatten could not help but interject angrily. This is such a bad lie that it insults the intelligence of his and his colleagues. It's better for you to pretend to be mentally ill than to pretend to be an amnesiac. I'm speaking the truth, Klein responded frankly, looking into the eyes of Mountbatten and middle-aged police inspectors. It really could not be more true. Maybe it is, the grey-eyed police inspector said slowly. What? He really believed it. Klein was surprised himself. The grey-eyed inspector smiled at him and said, An expert will come in two days and believe me, she should be able to help you to recall your lost memories. Expert? Help me remember my memories? In the field of psychology? Klein frowned. Hey, what if his memories of Earth were exposed? He suddenly felt like facepalming himself. The young police inspector put down his notes and searched his desk and room. Fortunately, he focused on books instead of lifting the kettle. Well, Mr. Klein, thank you for your cooperation. We advise that you'd better not leave Tingen for the coming days. If you have to, please notify Inspector Mountbatten, or you'll become a fugitive, the grey-eyed police inspector warned. That's it? That's it for today? No other questions with deeper investigations? Or taking me back to the police station to torture me for information? Klein was at a loss. Nevertheless, he wanted to solve the odd turn of events brought about by Welch too.